Thank you a lot, Brian. I kept my own thanks very short here for evident reasons because we have a full program and a very exciting table. So I would like to start with the actual um, philosophy behind the bridge residency project. It's of course bridging in a very literal sense, as the title will say, research in the arts and science. It's also physical bridging um, faculties on campus, so it's physically a bridge, but also the bridge in art history, of course, has been used many times by artists to form their own artist uh, groups. And so what is important, I think, is to insist on that we are here having to deal with a kind of epistemological turn in art, that artists are not just interested in discourses, in forms, in expressions that unfold as sculptures, interventions, uh, installations, and so on, but that there is a kind of very interest in the material practices and also in the underlying connections to the ways how knowledge uh, of fields are been tied together and how knowledge is being generated. So I just came across this um, I don't know if you can recognize this, that these are not artists from our residency program. Can you imagine what this is on the left side on top? It's a Macintosh computer. On the right side, is a, it's an iPhone, um, a grinded iPhone, right? And a grinded Macintosh computer. And down there, there is um, a radio that has been decomposed in its material components. So that's interesting because even contemporary artists, this was a show uh, that I saw last weekend at the Kunsthalle Charlottenburg in Copenhagen, and there's a lot of interest in the materials, but very often it's to actually um, go beyond the forms and to see what's in the machines and how the machines that seamlessly invade our lives and our technical uh, devices, our techno-scientific world worlds, world rules, and how far they actually act more on us than we think. And of course, this is pointing also to awareness of media that we use in media arts. How many people are actually being killed um, when I buy my digital devices? How many people are being killed in open mining conditions or in disastrous poisonous working conditions when I do a digital artwork? And this very often is not being addressed, right? We have the same in pigment history, of course, right? How many impressionist painters have been killed or the health uh, compromised by working with arsenic-based pigments for the first time that impressionist painters could go out into the green with these metal tubes produced by the industrial industry and actually getting their fingers completely stuck in arsenic paint, which was then dressing up as Scheele's green or Schweinfurt green or whatever, that was also at the same time used as a rat poison in Paris, right? So it's called also Paris green. So this kind of media awareness and awareness about the materialities is something that very often we have lost in art teaching, I think. And what is very important is to get back to a kind of media adequacy, to kind of media awareness and also to work with this kind of scopes of different patterns of mediality where not only we read the final form, but we actually read the networks of medialities that are being tied together. And I think the whole Bridge Artists and Resident Program is about that, to actually invite people who are interested in gaining this techno-scientific knowledge and making artwork that is finally also addressing this kind of patchworks of mediality and materiality in strong uh, correspondency with knowledge being produced in other faculties. And that is also a kind of idea to be pulled onto the marketplace as ideas, such as a Trojan horse, also as a strategy of interdisciplinarity, to pull this Trojan horse on the marketplace of ideas surrounded by ivory towers populated by hyper-specialized ideas. And therefore, we would like to also to increase this kind of different ways that art can use the role of interdisciplinarity, and this is actually the role. So matters matters, is obvious. The matters matter. So like the pigments, like the grinded iPhone, but also the matters that the matters of concern matter. And this is something that is then, of course, I mean, this is actually an image from a product that is serving in California for grass painting, right? You can, in, in terms of drought, actually solve the problem of uh, symbolizing the individual health by having sprayed a kind of emerald green very close to what we saw with the uh, toxic pigments before. 
and it's solving the projects, uh, problems at the surface, obviously, uh, only. And uh, so there's a kind of interesting term when we speak about what is research actually meaning in the arts and science. So research, we have a lot of artistic research right now, but very often the types of research are obviously not the same in the hard science, the soft science, and the artistic research. So it's very much, of course, to come up with the idea that research can be concerned with, the fine, for, with finding answers to given questions, but also artists are very much more interested very often in inventing new questions and not to finding answers to that questions that are already invented. So there's a different kind of role, and I think the way that research is being carried out also in society plays a role when we look at what's happening, that techno-science obviously is also obeying kind of social context and the political context and what kind of research is being produced and that we are not producing pure knowledge. So the very term of Technoscience is pointing to the fact that we are always uh, also conditioned by the tools by which we are doing research, but we are also conditioned, of course, by the research strategy, which is also a political one. So there is no pure knowledge as such. It's embedded in this techno scientific context. So, of course, we can imagine that, well, we all know that uh, climate change is an invention of the Chinese, and also there's a lot of greenwashing coming up when it comes to how uh, people on the surface, under the green label, are actually trying to reconvert their practices uh, that are being concerned with fossil fuels until now. So all this is kind of um, bigger scope of what the exhibition is about, about resources, the matter that matter to the artist, but also the artist matter, um, and how they con construct a kind of critical discourse that is self awareness also about how these media are being employed. So I think we have a very good example in our first panel already, very material research. So I would like to open this panel with uh, the duo, here constituted by Zbigniew Voxjuta and uh, Brad Day. So Zbigniew Voxjuta is an artist and architect I've been working with for 15 years right now, also as a curator, and who is uh, concerned with uh, the finding of alternative non-gravitational architectural spaces and soft materials, also a material agency, agency that is inherent in the material. And Zvignev has been uh, invited here to the British Artists and Residence Project to work with uh, Brad Day, a professor and associate department chair of, for research in the Department of Plants, Soil, and Microbial Science at Michigan State University. So that is the first panel. I would like to ask um, Zvignev first to say something like five, five or six minutes about the general research, what is driving you, and of course we'll then also talk more in, con uh, in, in context and in detail about the recent art project that he has been doing both also with the Science Gallery in Detroit this week and in re relationship with the lab here on Michigan State University. Spignev, the floor is yours. Okay, so I am an architect and, uh, and this is in the middle of the 70s, I'm working on vision biological architecture. It's a little bit approach to the project is different as an artist than I am as architect. So I actually I'm very often in exhibition where only architect in the group of bio artists. So uh, in architecture history, each 20 years architects have a vision of forms that are related to biology. But mostly they are only formal related. They are amorphous, they look like flowers and animals, bladders. But uh, material and technology behind these buildings are very traditional and has with biology nothing to do. So the idea was uh, for me to go step back and, to, and to ask how can we um, architecture uh, create as a biological way, maybe even breed, breed objects. I don't say houses, but maybe this is too, too far. Breed houses. So uh, there's a few images I will just jump. So um, I began to using liquid method to, to create object, to create object that I can be inside. You can see here um, balloon inside, floating inside of swimming pool. Inside of the balloon is, is jelly. And in this case, some special mix in gelatin. And this was made in Germany in a factory. Um, they produce uh, biological polymers. By rotating this balloon, I create uh, inside a membrane. Depend how much 
gel I put inside, which is liquid, and uh, the membrane is thicker or thinner and, uh, and uh, creates some, some stuff. Oh, I don't know how to show the movie. Yeah, yeah, just click twice. Okay. So you see, I am inside of this form, and this form is edible, has a taste, could have a smell, could have uh, a color, different color, and it is actually gel that is used over hundreds of years for breeding research in bio biological um, uh, research. So before new kind of jelly like agar agar was found in the middle of 19th century, they used gelatin. So, um, of course, uh, it will be great, but it is different kind of, of, of price and economy to use, for example, agarose, what we use here uh, for our project, uh, but in such a scale is, is quite the future. This is what we did, what we made in Detroit, in the science gallery in Detroit, uh, and this uh, looks a little bit, uh, the process how we are making this, and the piece is exhibited now in the Broad Art Museum. Uh, we are painting, there was a 150 kilograms inside the balloon, which is, was, um, has a, a black color. And th this is um, going to create what I am doing, edible landscapes, that not only forms, but also landscapes uh, uh, will be um, edible. And uh, the modeling also in uh, the museum is, uh, like an uh, architecture form floating in the uh, avocado oil. So the next step was using water as a form. So to create something liquid into water, and uh, it's also a movie shot in the uh, museum um, um, showing this method, uh, this totally liquid uh, technology, water in water, liquid or jelly into water, in creating big form. Of course, I can imagine, for example, like a space garden here, escape from gravity, and like a transparent rotating uh, bubble that has some kind of artificial um, gravity and can be uh, launched in space. That was a project of the space garden. I used this cleanostar, this is a machine that rotating over two axes, and um, plants are growing inside on a membrane made out of agarose and uh, grow in very special way because they don't know where it's up and down. And they are very sensitive uh, uh, for this forces, so-called gravitropism. This is rotating. You see nearly this ball, this pyroctor is like a, by rotation is like a, a out of gravity. So there were skipping this the movie. Yeah, so this last exhibition in Poland, in, German, uh, in, in, in uh, this uh, summer, I used robotic arm to the robotic arm very precisely, uh, have trajectory, and inside are growing uh, flux cells, and um, it creates a special tissues because also they have feeling for gravitation. And uh, my research was going more to smaller and smaller and smaller scale. This is like a Petri dish, they were working using plant in, uh, in uh, Buffalo University at Buffalo and creating jelly, um, uh, here's agarose bubble inside of water, in, floating in water. So, and uh, growing uh, uh, plant inside of this object. And then came much, much more to even genetical um, research uh, that is uh, made in in, uh, in Germany, in Cologne, and in uh, Max Planck Institute in Cologne, and I had the luck to work with uh, three scientists there. The institute was very famous for uh, transgenic um, research, and it was uh, um, um, it was allows me to work with them. This transgenic uh, bell belly and uh, these blue spots are, um, are what, uh, showing that uh, it's totally transgenic. Can you imagine, this is like a natural, natural genetic. There are some bacteria, uh, bacteria agrobacterium to a fatsians, they are living in the soil, and they can attack uh, trees, special trees, not all of trees, and, um, and change the how cells on the trunk of this tree are growing, you can create these so-called bulls or tumors. So 
Can you imagine this idea, what is very, very far away um, from practical research? What will it be if, I, if we work in a, such a collaboration? Bacteria attack the plant, change the DNA of the plant, and provoke this bubble. Scientists are coming to this already, trans, already transgenic cells and change it, this to create a house for birds. So many different species working together to, to use this uh, uh, question, how we as a, uh, can we influence how plant agrees. So I think this is already everything from my research, and we can go to research what we did together with the professor. Maybe yeah. can, should we can just uh, say a word, a, a sentence, on what is the idea about the project that is also shown in the Broad Museum that opens so this evening at 6. Roots make notes. What, what is this about in one sentence? And then we have probably Brad's So I think not is, is one of the first achievements of humankind. I think not is great. Begin of uh, our technology, begin of making ropes, making traps for animal nets, fabric and knots are very important in, uh, so very, uh, also in nature. So uh, we wanted that the roots of the plant, being plants, will make a, itself knot. We grow and make knot. So, and we start to work together with this. Right. So my research is primarily interested in how plants interact with their environment. Uh, I mainly work on plant diseases, uh, but in that we're very interested in how two primary elements of a plant, the leaves, interact with their environment. We all know about photosynthesis. Those are the primary sites where the, the plant is grabbing the sunlight and converting it to energy as well as, as making oxygen. Uh, the root is also a very interesting component of our research. Uh, we're primarily interested in how it interacts with the soil. Uh, it must tolerate a number of stresses, including water limited, or limited water, as well as pathogens. Uh, and in general, what we can do, or what, what I try to do, really what my lab tries to do, is to dissect how genes interact. So when gene one turns on, it turns on gene two. Gene two turns on, that turns on gene three. And it's the order in which genes are turned on and the level to which they're turned on that ultimately result in the creation of a leaf or a root. Uh, and we try to understand how can we manipulate how much a gene is turned on to limit the stochastic interactions. And at the surface, all of this is really regulating chemical gradients. And so we chose the root as our, kind of our chemical gradient that we're going to be focusing on because it's very responsive to gradients. It's a great sensor for what chemicals are present in the environment. And so if you think about gravity, uh, plants, you know, I mean, it's just an amazing question. How do plants know where gravity is? Why are the roots below ground and the shoots are above ground? Uh, and so a lot of this is controlled by the gravitotropism response in plants which is also rooted in the uh, expression and dose of a hormone. Too much hormone in one side of the plant will cause the plant to bend, to arc. Uh, and, and, and these hormones are controlled by genes. So the plant on the tip of the root senses where water is and it controls the gene expression to turn that root growth towards the water. And so that's, not, that's why roots just aren't straight down but they're seeking whatever water is present in the environment. So we're going to control uh, roots uh, and the growth by creating a chemical gradient within a jelly-like structure, agarose structure. And we are going to also use gravity uh, to let the root grow and to control the growth of that root and to turn it into a knot. And so the basic principle here, if you, it's a short movie, is that gra this is gravity, right? So if you took one of your house plants and laid it on its side, over time, the plant will know which is up and which is down, and it will alter its growth. And it's doing that, if you look now, maybe think of the stem as a banana, where that most curved part of the banana is, that is a high concentration of a specific type of hormone. And so cells are growing very rapidly in that region and turning the root north. Now, sunlight also plays a role in this, as does gravity. So in the project with Zbigniew and Adam, we're going to be controlling this growth by manipulating the signals that the plant is normally looking for and we're going to trick the plant into 
tying itself into a knot. Uh, so that's, that's what we're doing. Uh, I'm a gene jockey. This is quite, quite a, an interesting experience to work with Zbigniew and Adam. And, uh, but, you know, in biology, I mean, if you look around this room, right, we're all different. Everything is possible with biology. Uh, and we can control a lot of the biology by just understanding the science behind it and adding certain signals to coax the organism into doing what we would like it to do. So hopefully by the end of the exhibit, hopefully probably within the next couple of months, we will start to have remnants of various types of knots tied into our soybean root. So that's my uh, contribution to the project. I mean, there's a certain aesthetics here in the, uh, in the artworks. I mean, the one looks as you described it also like a Rubik's cube. You could also color the, the cubes. Then there's an aesthetic to this bubble. I mean, they are very evocative objects, not only of research. And how far do you think that the inspiration that an artist uh, like uh, Spingig can bring to your lab, is it something that is changing the way that you are asking questions? You know, I've, I've, I've assured him uh, as we go through this project, even though it is biology and there's going to be hiccups along the way, we can't control biology. Uh, Mother Nature's been working on that for billions of years. But um, what we've started, what my experience with Zbigniew and Adam have been is really looking at the basic elements, the basic structures, the shapes. All of us, all of our bodies are made up of the same shapes. It's just how those shapes are expressed and how many shapes are in certain dimensions, right? Some of us may have more shapes right here around the midsection. Uh, plants are the same way, uh, different types of leaves. So understanding the basic element of the shape. Uh, and so for me, it's been a very interesting and very really seamless interaction with him because we're very meticulous. I think we're both very meticulous and interested in the primary structure and then understanding how we can grow or manipulate a very basic shape which we really can't alter, but how can we try to understand how to put it together like a puzzle? Uh, and so a lot of what we're going to be doing, the aesthetics are very important within the cube. So we have two experiments going on. One is the sphere, which uh, we're going to be rotating, and that's where we're going to tie our knot. Uh, and we're going to be using gravity and chemi chemistry uh, to do that. For the cube here, what we're going to be doing is creating, in essence, we're going to, we're going to control where that root goes based on chemical attractants or repellents. And it's going to be invisible. We're working on getting this even more transparent. So think of a Rubik's cube. Inside this cube are individual Rubik's cubes, all the individual pieces. Each one of those individual pieces is either going to attract that root or repel that root. And so at the end of the exhibit, you know, maybe we could write a Spartan S or a Z or, a, or whatever we need to do by just guiding the root through the maze. I would like to say also, that I see this uh, collaboration like uh, from a wider spectrum. And uh, um, we are using many biological um, materials, for example, in architecture. But to, to, to build a um, wood house, we have to cut the trees. So the tree, we use dye matter to dyeing matter for our architecture. What will be if we can use this knowledge how plants are growing? Maybe I am just to dream, okay? Mm -hmm. To create, to 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 maybe not control, but maybe work with plant that they grow in special form and maybe create uh, shelters for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one idea would be, I'm sure we've all been familiar. If you haven't seen it in person on the internet, the square watermelons that you've seen that are in Japan, and they are actually in Japan. Now they're square because they found themselves during early development of the fruit in a in an acrylic box. But underlying that growth in this acrylic box were, was a manipulation of the chemistry and the genetics behind it. The plant could have continued to outgrow this box, but rather it met resistance with the walls, it changed the expression of the genes, and obviously the physical aspects of the restriction controlled this square watermelon. Uh, and so, you know, the idea of, of creating a birdhouse on the side of a tree, uh, maybe, not in our lifetime, I don't think, but... Uh, Possible. Speaking of, you are not only an architect, 
uh, but also a conceptual artist. And uh, very often when in art, architecture is being accepted as a form of expression, very often it has more a symbolic meaning. It's not actually doing the stuff. I mean, I worked a lot also with an artist like Philip Ram, for example, and it's a lot of evocation of what could be happening with meteorological architecture, with prototypes that is simulating this and this conditions and make people aware. But for you, what is important, it seems that here we're really dealing with material science-based research that is not just to get a discursive message out, not a symbolism, not a metaphor, but for you it's very important that you touch matter, that you have your hands on, that you get your hands wet and dirty. Why? I, in um, project what I'm doing, I never show some animation that are created, for example, in a computer. The all objects that I showed are really, if they may be they may be success or less success, what we're doing, and we have to deal also with, um, um, with unsuccess, for example, in Detroit. This was not really that how we want, because biological matter is, has own um, dramaturgy, and we have to follow this. So there's no so images that not really research is behind in my, in my work. Okay. I think we have to close the first part of the panel. Thanks very much for your input. That was very enriching. you have to go. So uh, our second uh, group, not to say duo, because actually it's going to be a trio, is uh, reflecting on cosmology, on the elements, on material science, but more from the physics side. So we have a piece up there that is opening this evening, which is very poetic, which is very beautiful, which is mesmerizing, which is again something that is based on a very simple idea that, for example, when you have water, which is of course the element that is making life possible on the planet, that at the same time it's a combination of two gases that by themselves are explosive as Adam Brown always reminds us, and therefore we have a kind of paradox when we water, and what we are doing in the gallery is actually splitting water into the elements and the gases again. So there's a very poetry in reversing history, reversing color, cosmology, and so on. So I would like to welcome Dimitri Gelfand and Elvili Dominic and Sean Couch. So Dimitri and Evelina work uh, with uh, sensory immersion environments that merge physics, chemistry, and computer science and also are uh, very much interested in uncanny philosophical practices with a background also in very, uh, very interesting areas such as Russian biocosmism and so on. So and Sean so Couch is uh, here as uh, the SMA's, uh, SMU Department of Physics, Astronomy and Departments of Computational Mathematics representative and uh, I think their research uh, has a lot of uh, convergence so thank you for joining this panel. So, um, Evelina and I, um, when we uh, initiated our uh, artistic pursuit, decidedly departed from, the, from art's age-old infatuation with uh, solid state and uh, fixative media and, and the illusion of uh, permanence and of a uh, object comp comprised reality. We instead opted to work <coughs> with fluidity, with uh, gases and liquids, with, um, with light, with light, and other ways of uh, propagating waves and fields. And you see an image here of uh, hydrogeny, uh, a piece we are presenting here. Uh, this is not a piece we are created at MSU, actually an instrument that we are interested in and hopefully we'll work with it in the future is the heavy ion collider. And we visited it at various stages of construction, so when it will be ready we'd love to do some experiments there. However, um, yes, uh, hydrogen that is made observable in our installation is the primary, uh, primary element of the universe and in the history of science it played a major role in the development of our knowledge, especially leading to quantum physics and to very um, 
uh, strange, I, very uh, non-intuitive ideas. The something that we never encounter in our experience. So that's exactly this, the things we like to uh, make uh, 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 accessible to the senses. It's a very challenging task. Uh, however, uh, we are not giving up. And uh, in, in this installation, we're using a laser sheet to scan this very tiny hydrogen bubbles that indeed as a gas they cannot exist on our planet because the gravity of the planet is not enough to keep hydrogen so it either escapes back into space or is connected into other molecules and uh, of course we mm, we would like uh, so this work we will not talk so much about it but we wanted to present you another piece that we recently did in collaboration with LIGO, the uh, Laser Gravitational Wave uh, Observatory. And it was a huge scientific discovery that uh, first uh, registered some kind of a telltale sign of a collision of two black holes. And uh, black holes is such a you know, common phrase in our culture that people just believe that they exist and that they've been registered. So, for example, and they're, that they're very observable and we have seen them and NASA has photographs of them, <laughs> um, which, of course, is uh, absolutely not true. However, we managed to create a fluid dynamic analog of two corrotating black holes connected uh, with this, what is called Rosen-Einstein Rosen bridge in quantum physics, which is also uh, in, well, in, in quantum cosmology. gravity, yes, which is also known as a wormhole. And you know this idea from science fiction very well, this kind of corridor in space that allows you to move faster than the speed of light. Uh, and maybe we can show the video of this piece and... Well, actually, uh we were going to, to look at uh, some of some of Sean's research, and then we were. I mean, but we can we can yeah. we can change the because order of. we would uh, like to also show some of these connections. How, by not really being able ever to look uh, on into black holes or to photograph black holes or even to come close to our star, and what Sean is studying are neutron stars. So how. It is uh, physically not possible to have direct experience of such matters. Uh, nonetheless, you can create um, fluid dynamic analogs, you can create theoretical models, and how we found out from our interaction with Sean that, for example, in neutron stars, the, the nuclei, like the, the most dense, high energetic uh, fragments of matter that can exist, how they form fluids, and their behavior is the closest to fluids. So maybe we show you a few videos that are indeed very simply done, just with water, just uh, creating particular conditions between water and light, and how light behaves. So maybe you can tell a little bit about what we're seeing. So yes, there's a uh, two meter uh, tank of, of water and it's divided into several sections, uh, one of which uh, has a uh, linear actuator that it plunges in, into that uh, section and causes the water to be displaced through a beveled uh, gateway and uh, this is what creates uh, these uh, entangled vortices. A vortex pair, and um, very much akin to the double slit experiment. And uh, w what is quite amazing that a shape of a vortex is a minimal surface area, and the behavior of light around it as it bounces through it creates this extremely dark shadow with a rim of light around it. And of course, as far as black holes go, we mostly have theoretical models of what can happen in certain. Gra when gravitational conditions and in, in certain super dense environments and 
the, these theoretical models tell us that a black hole should have something like an ergo, it is called ergosphere or a rim of light around it. And there is a scientist, uh, Silke Weinfurter, uh, in the University of Nottingham that ha has what she calls a black hole laboratory. She has a huge tank, three meter tank, with a gigantic water vortex, where with extremely uh, precise measurements and stereoscopic cameras, they uh, measure every wavelet and on the surface of this water and they indeed observe uh, similar phenomena that theoretically are found in black holes or considered to be existing in black holes and she registers them in this um, vortex, water vortex situation. So this uh, analogies were started by scientists in order to be able to create some sort of experiments, real physical experiments with matter in order to understand these inaccessible realities of our universe. And yes, maybe now we can look at this other vortex. So this was our artwork with vortices trying to stage uh, some black holes and now we show you a video of a scientific experiment. While we're waiting for this, maybe a question about the art that is relating to this experience, because what is interesting is that currently you're showing this work in a museum in Bergamo, but in a show also about the very importance and role that matter and natural realities has had in the history of art, and you are um, entangled with artworks from Fontana, Buri, and uh, I think there was also works by the Italian Nucleari, yeah, which were actually, actually very interested also in nuclear physics also in the 70s and 80s already. So when you, it's more than just a kind of poetic and philosophical visualization. So there is a, very, a kind of accomplishment to actually stage the phenomena, not as a representation, but as the phenomena as such. So this seems to be the, the, the connecting point between all your artworks. Yeah, most most definitely, it is the the experience itself, and, and the uh, the the bewildering workings of uh, human perception. That's that's really um, something that uh, that that cannot quite uh, come to a surface uh, per se. It, it is uh, um, the the artwork uh, takes place in 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 the mind of of the observer. And of course, we are huge admirers of um, uh, Kazimir Malevich and this whole um, avant-garde movement in uh, Russia. And um, so it was very clear. So and uh, Malevich was especially against the color green that he did, he didn't use in his paintings. Uh, and he, he wrote said that it was, it's so pleasant to the eye that it's like a lazy cow. Yes. <laughs> so, but uh, they, their intention was to stop painting, mm. to kill painting, to kind of get away with it. And Malevich, after painting Supremacist uh, works for three years in 1818, he stopped painting. 1918. 1918, he stopped painting. And all this abstract painting, burning the canvases, cutting the canvases, these are this, the artists trying to finally kill this art form. And I, I, to, I love the work of Buri, uh, absolutely adore all these great masters. It was a special pleasure to be in the same exhibition with them because I think what we do is the next step after painting has been killed so many times and by such elaborate means that you have to do something else. <laughs> that was clear. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, uh, as, as Malevich put it, uh, the world as objectlessness. And here we have some, something that is quite uh, objectless. And the, the idea of objectlessness, I, I must say, came about when, when Malevich uh, the first version of the black square was not a painting, but was a backdrop to uh, an extraordinary uh, theatrical endeavor, victory over the sun. And here we have yeah. a victory of sorts uh, in front of us. Yeah. So this is uh, uh, something from my work. And so um, what Evelina and Dimitri 
some of their pieces um, try to take this very ephemeral, ephemeral astrophysical and physical concepts and make them more real in a sense and make them more terrestrial, I think I'm going the other way. So I put them on a computer and I try to simulate them and I use <laughs> electrons <laughs> and ones and zeros. Um, and so what we're seeing here is actually a star trying to blow itself up. And so I, I study supernovae, which are the, the deaths of massive stars, and they're the birthplaces of neutron stars, uh, and also, in some cases, black holes. Um, and so this is sort of the real side of, of trying to understand the physical processes that drive these things. But one of the things that we've, we've kind of come in contact with um, talking is there's so many similarities in the basic physical concepts and the basic principles of what's going on. Um, and it's amazing that the things that we can experience here on Earth in a lab or in an artwork, um, those same things can apply to something as big as 10 times the size of our own sun um, and something that has the energy, um, the total energetic output of our sun over its entire 10 billion year lifetime in a few seconds, right? And so, you know, the physicality, the universality of, of physics is, is, is quite amazing. And, um, what you can see here, this is actually a laboratory experiment looking at some of the hydrodynamics that go on in the supernova explosion. So if you remember the, the movie that we just saw, it did this sloshing, like you saw that motion. And that, what you were seeing there, was uh, the size of a, a small country, right? But here you're, you're thinking about something that could fit in this room. Um, but the physics is the, the same, right? Uh, the, the behavior is the same. And so there's almost this scale-free nature to it. Um, that, that is just amazing, and that it comes out of the physics. So along similar lines, uh, we're going to look at a performance called force field, where, um, a lev where levitating, uh, acoustically levitated droplets of water um, dawn the dynamics of uh, spinning celestial bodies and also of um, spinning atomic nuclei. In the middle section, you will notice that there, the, oh, here, when we get to a higher amplitude, uh, this droplet will uh, start to divide into sectors, something that is, is known as uh, sectorial self-oscillation. And it kind of creates this big uh, structure. Here, 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 you realize the screen might be far for some of us, but here you will start to divide into these lobes while spinning. And these um, oscillation modes, our sun has it, so any liquid rotating uh, uh, astral body will have this dynamic fluid, fluid body will have a this kind of uh, uh, oscillation modes. So the, the, the droplets can be uh, ripped apart in, in, into these vapor clouds, and then they can recondense back into a droplet again, all just by means of uh, acoustics. So that at, at the bottom here is a uh, piezoceramic transducer. That's the source of the sound. And up above is just a, um, a reflective surface. So we create a, a standing wave such that uh, we have very uh, powerful acoustic fields in these areas. And then there are these semi-vacuous pockets where um, lightweight matter can be levitated. There is a resonance with a lot of philosophical writing of the last years. I mean, we talk about vibrant matter, the famous book that is inspiring all the art students problem right now, Jane Bennett, right? And so there is this kind of talk about this material agency. And the material agency very often when it comes to our art schools are still, I mean, it's, it's done in an evocative way, it's in a philosophical way. So what is the difference for you? Because you are coming also from this tradition. I mean, I, I was talking about, uh, um, Biocosmism, for example, escaping the Earth, 
creating a flagship outside, but what is the difference for you, the same question I asked to Zbigniew, to actually refer to these concepts of material agency, other kind of non-human agency, but to actually do it, create the phenomena, and then have the phenomena as a representation, but to have them on stage. That is the case also in the Broad Museum this evening. So the, this question about living and non-living and the, the evolution of the universe from, uh, you know, from um, like super, I, I don't even know how I can signify this uh, stage of the beginning. It's still a kind of blurry, very, very blurry, but probably, you know, you come from very simple elements, nuclei and from hydrogen and then you go to elements, planets. So in uh, the ideas of biocosmism, uh, the, 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 the origin of lives there in this most simplest uh, manifestations of matter and universe and the, the whole agency is already there. And uh, uh, in our work, the, the, the deeper we look into the matter, into the materiality, which uh, a lot of it is emptiness, we have a work with vacuum. We are fascinated by things that you encounter in the universe that are very different to the conditions of our planet that is extremely dense, extremely heavy. So uh, we have a work with vacuum. We have multiple works with levitation because these are the more uh, original, the more common conditions of the universe where the agency is as well manifested. But of course, this question, what is living, what is non-living, where life begins, where consciousness begins, the deeper you go into matter, the, the more they lose their meaning because the deeper you go into matter, the higher energies you encounter, the stronger forces you encounter. And um, um, yes, so it's definitely, we, do not possess the, the agency. The agency is much, much deeper. It's really, maybe you can talk about neutron, the nuclei, the nuclei that, uh, so we are mostly emptiness. We, we need this emptiness, this empty space, but all the uh, agency is in the, in the nuclei. So right. can you t right. tell us about neutron stars, yeah. where the agency yeah. is coming from? Uh, I don't know <laughs> if I can tell you where their agency is coming from, but I can tell you all about neutron stars. Their travel agency. Uh, that's right, that's right. They do get around, I mean. I mean, the, the, all this, Super energy, super yeah. power that yeah. creates all the elements. All so uh, Sean told to, to us exactly this reverse the origins. Where yeah. do all the oxygen come from? It yeah. doesn't come from plants. Pr plants just metabolize it for us. It was created in the star explosions. Yeah. And these supernova explosions. And you explosions. need this huge amounts of energy, this super gravitation, this very strange, very exotic conditions to actually create most of the stuff that we are using and me metabolizing. Yeah, and so you started to uh, reference the beginning, right? In the beginning, um, out of the Big Bang that, that was the beginning of our universe, only hydrogen and helium, mostly hydrogen, was created, right? With a little bit of helium. Um, and so those are the most abundant things in the universe, right? And I think that's one connection to the, the piece that they're um, exhibiting uh, in the Broad now, this creation of hydrogen, this most abundant thing in the universe. Uh, but the other piece of that is the oxygen, right? That you're busting apart these water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and that oxygen is, is one of the most important things for life, right? Uh, we're mostly oxygen by mass, right? We think we're mostly water. We are, but water is mostly oxygen. The, all of that oxygen came from these kinds of explosions that I'm studying. They drive the chemical evolution of the universe, starting out from that just hydrogen and helium. All of that hydrogen and helium then gets collected into stars, and those stars become giant nuclear furnaces, and they process that hydrogen into ever heavier and heavier and heavier elements, including oxygen, uh, all the way up to eventually iron, um, and then they stop there. And uh, in the process, that's where supernovas come in. and that's where supernovas come into play. Iron, iron's the last stop. It's the most tightly bound atomic nucleus, um, and they can't burn iron essentially. And so they collapse under their own weight. Their own gravity causes them to collapse. And this sets off a chain of events which is incredibly energetic. 
These stars last for millions, millions of years, but then their death is a fraction of a second. So you take something that's one and a half times the mass of our own sun, it's the size of the moon, and it collapses to the size of a city in a quarter of a second, um, moving at speeds a significant fraction of the speed of light, and then turns itself around somehow and explodes. Um, and in that very explosive process, that oxygen that eventually makes its way into us and into the plants and into the oceans uh, is spread throughout the universe by these very energetic explosions. Um, and so that's sort of the, the very briefest history of where the elements come from. And so talking about material and matter and matter matters. Um, a lot of the matter that we're made of is made in these kinds of, of explosions. Um, and by mass, it's mostly oxygen. Um, hydrogen being a very, very important constituent of the universe as well. Um, but by mass, it's mostly oxygen. So, you know, Carl Sagan said it, we're, we're star stuff, right? And, and so the matter that we are made of really came from stars. But if you, like you also mentioned that if we, uh, the way we split water, mm. you can also mm. split molecules mm. and even then you split the, the, nuclei the nuclei of, I mean, you're already outside of the range of elements, you're yeah. just in the nuclei and yeah. that's exactly, yeah. these are the celestial objects that you yeah. study, that yeah. they're just a, a soup of yeah. kind of half nuclei, the, this beats of nuclei. Yeah, so that's the other part of the story. So there's the, the creation of these, these elements that we're made of. Uh, but in this process, you start out with iron, which are nuclei, right? Um, and Evelina said it, we're mostly empty space, right? Like we, we know that we're nuclei are surrounded by these clouds of electrons, and so we're very much less dense than nuclei. But in the process of creating a neutron star, essentially you occupy all that empty space. And these neutron stars really are the density of atomic nuclei, 100 trillion times denser than water. Um, and there is this breaking apart as well. And so in the piece that Evelina and uh, Dimitri are exhibiting, they're breaking apart the molecules of, of water into their constituent parts. In the process of a supernova explosion, we're breaking apart iron nuclei. You actually bust apart the nuclei in, in a fission process into the constituent parts, which in this case are just free protons and neutrons. and then. Uh, at sufficiently high densities, those free protons and neutrons are like a fluid. That's how I treat them when I actually try to study these things. I, I treat them like they're a fluid because that's how they behave. And so it's a, a fluid sea of free neutrons. But it must be so dense that is so much denser than any kind of iron tight lattice that's we right. can ever imagine. So how do you even imagine such a dense liquid? I can imagine quite a lot, um, but it is. It is 100 trillion times denser than water, and so it, it's literally the density of atomic nuclei. And so these things are, you know, it's, a neutron star is essentially a giant atomic nucleus in space that weighs one and a half, two times the mass of the sun. Um, and what's incredible, I think, and this comes back to what we were saying before about the universality of physics, that my physical equations work, even at those, those densities, given the right input physics. Um, but they're more or less the same equations that we would use to study fluids in a laboratory here on Earth. You know, the, the physics is in some sense universal. And so it applies even to this extreme matter, this is extreme fluid of free neutrons just swimming around uh, like a giant ocean. Um, it, and it still works. And that's why the, the video that we showed earlier of uh, the standing water experiment that was done in the laboratory, that's why that's a good analog because the equations actually are the same. They're, the equations are the same that, that describe both phenomena. Um, yeah, we have a problem with another critical dimension. This is time is a yeah. kind of <laughs> rare commodity <laughs> this afternoon. But we are very pleased to get uh, Evelina and Dimitri back here on campus, I think, because the first visit they did was actually also having a look on the construction of the cyclotron. And this is an amazing experience, of course. And so we hope to get you back for another kind of project on campus. And this is also pointing a little bit to the next uh, panel, because in the next panel we're also dealing with uh, what all energy is needed here on campus to actually make this experience happen. And which is also why you have, of course, a power plant here on campus. <laughs> and then we have an artist group that is working precisely what uh, we can do with all the, well, the CO2 generated to, for the energy consumption here on campus <laughs> precisely and how to absorb the CO2. And this is one of the projects that we are going to discuss after the break. I, I think we should, should shut it down a little bit to 10 minutes, get a coffee and be here in 10 minutes again because we're a little bit late on track.